Now let us turn our Bibles and continue in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Now we have just read Samuel rebuking the people very plainly, telling them that they have done wickedly before the Lord. Look at verse 13. Now he says, Now therefore behold the king whom you have chosen, and the Lord has set a king over you. Now what is wrong with that? We have learned that it is nothing wrong for them to have a king. But notice this word, whom ye have desired. It was not God's desire at this time or for them to have this particular king. David was not even born yet. So it was the people's desire that is what is wicked. And ultimately, they only wanted a king to be like the nations of the world. We read that. That was their heart. That was the wickedness. So Samuel now openly rebukes them and reminds them once again. Now, not only that, Samuel did something. Now, look at verse, um, verse 15. Uh, sorry, verse 17. Now, he says... Now, is it not wheat harvest today? I will call on the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. Now, what is Samuel planning to do? What was he trying to do? He said, I will call God to send thunder and rain on this day, which is the day of harvest. They have been well, waiting for this day. So to them, it's a very important day, right? They've been planting, um, caring for their harvest for many months now, and it is the day of harvesting, which means that probably the harvest is great, the best day to harvest. And this was the day appointed for harvesting. But he says, I will ask God to destroy your harvest. Now to show them their wickedness, and God did so. Now we learn why. Why Samuel chose to do that afterwards? But at least we understand what was happening first. Now, but then in between, in between, before he asked God to destroy their, their crops, he, he instructed them. All right, look at verse 15. Now he says, now, verse 14, sorry, now he says, Now if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and rebel not against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord. Now he encouraged them. Yes, I've just rebuked you, but I want to instruct you, continue to follow closely after this God and serve him and obey all his commandments. Now after he sent, he asked God to send thunder and rain to destroy the crops, now he came back to this again. Look at verse, look at verse 19. Now they... Look at verse 19. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants. They were afraid when they saw that. And they said, I pray, to thy, I pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. So now they true is really sunk into them that they have done wickedly. Now then again Samuel said in verse 20, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then shall, should you go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Then he says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. He encouraged them. He instructed them. Now he encouraged them. Yes, you have done this great wickedness. But as long as you continue to follow the Lord, He will be with you. He will continue to treat you as His people and provide for you and live in your midst. Now, what is this about? Now, ultimately, the title for today's message, I believe, describes what is going on here. It is not too late. It is not too late. Look at how Samuel puts it. Verse 20, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness. 
they realize now this is wickedness before the eyes of God. And it's terrible wickedness, and especially as they see the sight of their crops being demolished in their own, before their eyes on that day. Their hearts were probably wondering, is it all over for us? And they plead, please pray for us. And here he says, well, although you have done this wickedness, now as long as you turn not aside from the Lord, he will be in your midst to bless and to provide and to protect. It is not too late. But then there is a final warning in verse 25. But if ye shall do still, still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. There was still the warning. It is not too late, but it's up to you whether you want to make it too late. And there is no turning back. In God, well, consuming you, both you and your king. Now, this was the scene that we have just witnessed. Now, what are the lessons that we need to learn from, from, this, from this passage? Well, first and foremost, as I've mentioned, it is not too late to regain God's favour after you have fallen into grievous sin. It is never too late. Never too late. Now, sometimes in life, we may have made willful a willful choice in some areas of our life, some foolish mistakes. We did not take heed to counsel, and we made some decisions willfully, foolishly. And some of these decisions, they cannot be reverted. We are in that situation already. Sometimes it is easy for us to feel discouraged, at least fearful like them, and wonder, is it all over for me? Don't be discouraged, all right? Here we learn that when we choose to live rightly in that situation, it is not too late. God will not forsake us. Only fear the Lord. That is the instruction. Now, but I want to make it clear what this is, passage is not about, all right? It is not about a situation where, well, let's just sin first and ask for forgiveness. That is how the world puts it, right? Let's just do wrong and ask for pardon later on. This is in no me by no means giving us the idea, well, let us sin then, then get what we want. And when we get what we want, well, from this passage, well, they got the king that they wanted, right? Then from this passage, yet, if they continue to follow God, well, things will be fine. This is not teaching us to do that. It is not teaching us, well, I want to get married to an unbeliever. I know God commands against it, but I want to. That's my, look at the word that Samuel uses, um, whom ye have desired. You have a desire in your heart, an evil desire. And you think, never mind, I will just go ahead to marry this person and then ask God for forgiveness later. But at least I married the person that I desired. And in marriage, when I'm in marriage, then I will continue to obey God and, and, and follow His commandments and so on. Don't be foolish. There are consequences for sin. They face severe consequences, as we'll see in the, in the weeks to come, God willing, in the passages to come. Don't be so foolish. This is not encouraging us to sin, that grace may abound, as the New Testament um, warns us. Now, this is not teaching us to intentionally enter into a contract, enter or take a loan or, or pursue something in life, knowing that it is contrary to God's word. Don't worry, I'll, I'll do this first, and then, well, I can obey God after that. You know, there are people who think, well, let me take a fly-in and fly-out job. Yes, I know that I will end up breaking God's commandment. I will hardly be around on Sundays. But you know, I can earn more in fly-in, fly-out job. So when I'm earning more, I'll give more to the church. And then during my off days, I can serve God better. I will obey God, but I just want to take the job first. Don't think that this, script, that this passage is encouraging us to do that enter or enter into some financial commitments. Young person, I lust after these things. I will take a loan. I will, I, will, I will fulfill the desires of my heart. 
And after I got what I want, yes, then I will obey God. This is not what this passage is teaching. It is situations where, well, for example, some, they never they were not taught properly. They didn't know. Then they entered into sin. Then they realized, like these people, now they see even more clearly, this is weakness. I've sinned against God. But I am in a situation already, a situation that I cannot revert. I must just be ready to bear those consequences, but I should not be discouraged. I should not feel that, well, God will never use me again, will never draw close to me again, even if I repented. Even if I repented in the sense of, now I will do my best to obey Him in this, in this situation that I brought myself foolishly into. Now, don't be discouraged. So knowing the, the lesson, knowing that it is not too late, is to help us not to be discouraged. God is merciful. God will forgive if, if we turn to Him. So God was giving them a fresh start, so to speak. Perhaps, elderly, you've made some decision in your younger days. Maybe you committed certain sin in your life that maybe no one knows about, not even your spouse. And you're very remorseful, and you wish you could turn back time, and you can't now, but there are some consequences. Don't be discouraged. Maybe some of you made some choices in life, and you had to pay the consequences. Don't think that it is over, all right? Now, Satan wants us to think that sometimes, to think that, well, it is over for you. God won't use you ever again. Even if you obey God, He won't use you. And we fall into the sin of feeling, well, anyway, I'm such a terrible Christian. Even if I turn back to God, I'm still going to be useless. Then we continue in our sin, right? Then we say, well, I, then I may as well continue in this low Christian walk, this low life. Because it is too late. Don't think like that. Don't think like that. Just as much as we shouldn't feel that, well, sin and then ask for give forgiveness, here God says, stop being discouraged. This is a great encouragement to the people, right? A great encouragement. Now, but please remember, while God encourages us with that, you have gone astray, you have been foolish, now you're awakened to it, and you turn back to God. Now this statement that it is not too late comes with conditions conditions that is the next thing we must learn there are conditions while we don't we are not discouraged but we must remember there are conditions now samuel repeatedly warns them look at verse um, verse 14 immediately after um, rebuking them he says now if you fear the lord the first thing condition of fearing the lord then the second thing if you would serve him then the third thing, if you obey his voice and not rebel against his commandments. Hmm? And then later on, later on, look in verse, um, verse 20. If you turn not aside from following the Lord, repeating that again, but serve the Lord. All right? So he repeats that, serving God, following him. God will not forsake you. So there are conditions. So don't think that, wow, great, you know, God will forgive me and it's not too late and I continue in my sin. There are conditions for this. While God encourages us, we must also realize He expects us all right, to live a certain way. Now, so that is, two, there are two key things that I hope we, we draw away for ourselves from here. First, I've said many times, it is not too late, but there are conditions. So remember, there are conditions. How do I know these conditions? How do I live by them? We will see after this, all right, in the application. So first one, don't be discouraged. Now, plow on. Stay close to the Lord. He will draw close to you. He will be among you. Come back to Him. Now, but then... Why does God want them to know it is not too late? That is the question, the more important question we have to ask ourselves. It's not just to think, yeah, it's not too late, and I will obey God. It is not too late, and that is it. That is it. No, there is an important point that God needed them to understand. Why He 
gives them a fresh start and tells them it's not too late. Now, that is found in how Samuel dealt with the situation to bring forth that point to them. Look at verse, verse 18. Sorry, verse 17. We read just now. Um, now, is it not with harvest day? Then he said, I will call the Lord and he, will, he shall send thunder and rain. And then you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. This act of Samuel was to help, us, help them to understand what was this wickedness that they were really guilty of. But God would say, I will, I will forgive, I will give you a second chance, it is not too late, but I need you to understand the wickedness that you have done. Verse 18. And so Samuel called on the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord, and they understood we have done wickedness. What did they understand? Why must Samuel choose this particular miracle, so to speak? All right? What was it to what was, it, what was in it to teach them the lesson? Now, what did they want? A king, right? What did they want? A king. A king like other nations. They said that. And God says this desire is the wickedness. They wanted a king to be like other nations, meaning this. Well, the, the, other, the kings of the nation, they go out and fight our battles, all right? They, this king, well, they will take more lands for us. Whatever land we want to pursue, we will conquer. Israel was not supposed to do that. Now, when we have more land, we have more crops. We become richer. And it is a king that will provide for us and protect us. So that was what they've been saying to God all the while. Hence, Samuel said, you have rejected God as your king. Remember? Look at verse 12. Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord was your king. What they were asking for was this, a king that will protect them and provide for them and pursue what they want their nation to be like, which is like the rest of the world. Now you say, why destroy the crops? Why destroy the crops? On the most important day, suddenly wiped out. All right? So for the next many, many months, they'll be suffering from this, still reeling from it. Why create this effect? Now, firstly, the destruction of the crops was to teach them. When you have a king, even if you had a king, even if you conquer more land, it is not the king that will protect you or provide for you. It is God, your God, that is the one. And I will show you easily in your own sight. You have worked so hard. You have give, Now all these are ready for harvesting. God just needs to send thunder and rain and they will all be wiped out. Well, maybe thunder, some of it struck the land, caught fire, burned. Rain, totally um, swept away the crops. Both fire and rain. In just one moment, do you think that it is your king that you desire that can protect your crops, that can provide for you? No, it was always God. Now, but then still, then still, why destroy the crops? Why don't teach them some, through some other lesson it is God that provided? Why destroy the crops? Now, it's to teach them. If you would want to live for your desires, then God will stop providing for you. In other words, God might as well destroy everything that, is, that he meant for your provisions when you refuse to live for him, when you refuse to do his purposes, when you want to use all these things for your own life, for yourselves, God might as well remove all of them because everything that God provides for them, the land, the harvest, the protection, what is it for? So that they can enjoy all these things, eat all these things, have pleasure? No. It's to provide for them in order that they may live out their covenantal purposes. That was the key point. So the destruction of this 
was not only to teach them God is your protector, God is your provider, but also to teach them that God will cease being your protector and provider if you would not live for his desires but your own desires. That was what Israel had to learn. So don't think that, well, I'm given a second chance, well, it is not too late. God wants me, as long as I go back to him, God wants me to enjoy my life as long as I obey him. Not so at all. So this was a deliberately chosen um, um, miracle to teach them this very important lesson. Now, it is strongly substantiated by the fact, again, when you look, of the repeated word. What is that? We learned last week. The Lord, capital L or R D. The Lord. And from verses 13 to verses 25, it's the Lord was repeated 20 times. And the way Samuel spoke is, is an unusual way of speaking, all right? For example, I just draw your attention um, maybe to verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent um, thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And now it can be easily, God can easily replace this account by saying him. First time the Lord, then after that, him, 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 right? Now look at verse 17, for example. Um, it is not, is it not with harvest? I will call on the Lord. And he will send thunder, and he says, in the sight of the Lord, your king. Uh, in asking that, in the sight of the Lord, in you asking for a king. So repeatedly, he could say him, all right? And look at um, verse 20, for example. Following the Lord, but serve the Lord, not serve him. Repeatedly, again, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, in the same sentence. Capital L or R D, as we always understood from scriptures, is to remind us of the covenantal name of God, Jehovah. Jehovah, God has, God gives himself many names, all right? Not that he loves many names, but each name describes part, some of his, his characteristics, his attributes, focuses on certain part of, of his working. And here, capital L or R D is always referring to his covenantal name. Israel was chosen by God. Israel was picked by God among all nations, formed by God to be in covenant, to feel, fulfill covenantal purpose. Last week we said, what is in a covenant? Number one, there is a purpose. That is why people enter into a covenant. Number two, there are parties involved. Here, God and Israel. Number three, there are penalties, all right? There are conditions which we will see very soon again. Now, I want you to notice verse 20. All right, so let's learn the lessons first before we apply. Look at verse 20. Um, sorry, verse 22. Now, he gives the reason. He give, Samuel gives the reason why it is not too late if they turn back to the Lord. Why? Why is it not too late if they turn back to the Lord? Verse 20, for the reason. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. He just described the covenant. The Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. It's not for your sake. God giving you a fresh start. God telling you it is not too late. It is not for your sake that you will continue to enjoy life on earth. It is not for your sake. It's for his name's sake. This is a suzerainty covenant. We keep learning about that theologically. But application-wise, we must remember. Suzerainty covenant means God will fulfill the covenant. It means God's purpose will never fail. Do you understand why God's purposes will never fail? It's because it's a suzerainty covenant. He will always ensure that it is accomplished. So for him to say, now, if you turn back, this is what I will do. It's because they were supposed to fulfill God's purposes. If they do not want to fulfill the covenantal purpose, then there is no reason why they should get the crops. That is the lesson. Now, that is the application for us as well, isn't it? Christian, yes, we should be encouraged. We should be joyful, knowing that we have strayed from the Lord, we have departed from the Lord, we have committed certain sins willfully against the Lord. And now today we hear, the Lord, the Lord will not forsake us if we meet those conditions. What is your joy meant to be about? It is not about 
God will not chastise me anymore. God will bless me instead. It is not that. It is that now I am restored. I am allowed. I am now the privilege again to fulfill my covenantal purpose on earth. That is what I rejoice about. It is not too late. I can still be fulfilling and my covenantal purpose. God will still use me. That is why I rejoice. That is why I am so happy. Not, I'm so happy now, God will continue to protect my job, protect my family and my income and my health so that, well, life on earth will be nice. No, it is not that. The re, the, this particular miracle was chosen specifically and the repeated name, capital L or R D, was draw them to this very key point. The Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. It was God's name, God's covenantal purpose. What was Israel supposed to be? What is this for God's own namesake? Not Israel's name. Not your name, my, rep my name, our reputation. Now, God's name means this. They were supposed to be witnesses, that people will know who this God is, God's name, who he is. Name described who he is. The people will know who God is. So Israel's covenantal purpose was to be a light to the world that the world will know who this true and living God is. But they did not want that. They want their own desires. I want to live for my own name, for my own kingdom, for my own purposes, for my own pursuit. God gives me another chance to pursue more of what I want to pursue. But God says, no, he does all this for his name's sake, for them to be a witness. Christian, why does God save you? We hear this to death. But has it truly sunk into our hearts? God entered into the covenant of grace. God drew you into the covenant of grace. You are saved by grace, the covenant of grace. By the way, please note, the Bible has the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament. The word testament means covenant. It's the same Greek word, testament. We are living in the New Testament. We are living in covenant with God, the covenant of grace, the same in the Old Testament, the same testament, different way of administration, the old way of administrating, which is to sacrifice us, the new way of administrating the Holy Communion, reminder, but the same salvation by grace, the same covenant. Now, Christian, we know all this theologically, but has it really sunk into us? God save us that we may be lights in this world to others. Not to live and pursue our own desires. That was Israel. Give us a king that we desire. What are your desires, my friend, today? Have you lost sight of that? Why God is in covenant with you? When you truly understand that, then you will rejoice over the right things. Now it is, I think, a very contrary message to most messages that you will hear in Christianity, modern Christianity today. Modern Christianity is all about you. God loves you. It's not God loves you, but it's God loves you. It is always about God wants to please me. Oh, God wants to give me a second chance. It's never too late. You see, God wants to continue to bless me. It's never too late means God wants to bless me on an ongoing basis, so that I enjoy my life as a Christian. It's a very different Christianity from what Christianity is from the beginning, from the Old Testament. It's always about God's name. God does everything for his name's sake. Can you accept that? I think many have come to a stage where they cannot accept messages like that. No, from the beginning, I always felt that well, God loves me. God wants to save me. God wants to give me what I want. God wants to bless me. What now you say is all about God? No, I cannot accept that. There are Christians who today, they do not like passages like that. It's for his namesake. Do you get upset when you hear it's all about God? Why do many Christians backslide? Why do many Christians fall, um, fall into the world, loving the world? Because of this concept. God wants to bless me. So I will pursue these things. In the end, they fall. They fall. Now, so these are the lessons. 
How do we apply them? I want to summarize the lessons first, all right? It is not too late, but there are conditions. And the reason why God continues to forbear and will not let it be too late if you turn back to him is as long as you turn back to him means you fulfill your covenantal purposes, he will continue to use you. That is the encouragement, all right? Not encouragement to sin. Now, then we come to the applications. Now, we say, Lord, I understand this. Now, I am saved to live for you, to serve you. I'm saved to fulfill your purposes. But, Lord, I've backslided so badly. Lord, I've fallen into grievous sins before. Lord, I want to come back to you. Lord, I want to fulfill my covenantal purpose. Lord, what should I do moving forward? Well, the instructions are given, all right? Well, first and foremost, look at verse 14. Now, if ye fear the Lord, so that's the first thing, if you fear the Lord. Now, but before I explain fear, I want you to notice how Samuel says this. Verse 14, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment, the commandment of the Lord, then shall, now, shall what? Both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord. Both ye and also the king. Now, why did he rope in Saul? Both you and your king. Why? Saul, Saul did not commit any sin so far. Right? Saul was not the one who said, I want to be king. Saul was not the one who said, we want a king. Saul was, was put to be king. All right? There was no sin on his part. And we studied earlier on. God was sincere in helping, in promising to help Saul if Saul obeyed him. Right? So there was no fault of Saul. So why both ye and your king? The lesson is this. For those of us who feel, I have not fallen into grievous sin, I have been following the Lord, well, this message is not for me. The rest of it, nothing for me to learn. Well, think again. Samuel, as Saul did not fall into sin, but it, the same instructions were given to Saul as well. Both you, yes, you have sinned. Yes, you have um, um, deliberately pursued your own desire against all God's instruction. Yes, you have sinned. But Saul, I need you to hear this as well. Don't be too happy you have not sinned and think the rest of the things that I'm saying, I'm instructing, I'm warning, does not apply to you. So it applies to all of us as well. Now then, let's learn. If you fear, fear the Lord. Now what is fear the Lord? Lord, I want to begin to fear you. Lord, I've not seen also, but I want to continue to fear you. What is fear? Now, for the believer, the fear of the Lord is always about our reverence for him, fearing to displease him, fearing to dishonor him, a fear of him with such love. Lord, I do not want to dishonor you. Lord, I do not want to displease you. I'm so afraid of grieving you, a child that truly loves the parents, a spouse that truly love, the spouse, will always have this kind of fear of displeasing, grieving the other party, right? So there is this fear. But there was the warning with the destruction of the crops. There must be also that fear to realize, I better fear when I deliberately sin. I better have a fear of God that God, while He is my heavenly Father, He is also a holy God. He will deal with my sins. He will, although I'm his child. I must not think that I can get away with deliberate obedience, disobedience. There must be that fear as well of the promise of chastisement. But dear friends, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? If not, you must have a trembling fear that there is a judgment to come one day. Now, whatever you may think, there is no such thing as judgment, there's no such thing as heaven, no such thing as the spiritual realm. Just like you, can, you, can, you do not see gravity, you cannot um, um, see um, many scientific laws, but they exist. You can ignore them, you can defy them to your own detriment. One day you will face this living God. I hope you have this trembling fear now because of the judgment to come and turn to him. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I saw the Holy Communion. I understand you came to die and pay for my sins. Please forgive me. Save me. 
I can't wash away a single sin of mine. But I thank you it is not too late. As long as I'm alive, I can turn to you for forgiveness. I want to obey you after I'm saved. Turn to him today. There must be this trembling fear for you. The fear, the Christian begins with this fear. Lord, I do not want to displease you by living for my own desires, but I want to please you by living for my covenantal purpose, to be a witness for you. That men will know who you are through the way I live, through me sharing the gospel. So that is fear. Now, then the next thing, what about, look at verse 14, fear the Lord and serve him, and to serve him, and to serve him. Now, what is serve the Lord? What does it mean? Because it's repeated, all right? Now, if you look at um, verse 20, he mentions serve again. He repeats serve many times. Why? What is serving God? Now, don't think that serving God means I must be given some ministry in church. I must be doing something in church for God, appointed to do something, given something to do in the church. Of course, service includes that. But when you put it in the context of God the King and them serving, it is to be a servant of God. What does a servant exist for? A servant exists for well, anything that the master says, this is my desire, this is what I want accomplished, the servant simply does it. It's not that, well, I have nothing, I'm not appointed in church to do anything, so, well, I have no service. Service is far bigger than that. Service is simply f beginning with a heart that says, you are king. And that was their problem. Lord, we don't want to serve you. We don't want you to be our king. We want to serve our own desires. Now, as long as you live for your own purposes, your own aims in life. You don't even include God in, Lord, what should I study? What should I take as a job? Lord, how should I bring up my family? Lord, how should I spend my money? You are just going to go ahead and do whatever you want with your resources. Then you can say, I'm not serving God. I'm not using my resources for God. God may as well destroy my resources, including my health. Right? Serve to serve God simply means, first and foremost in your heart, you are king. I submit to your will and I will do anything that you ask me to do. That is serve. It begins there. Now, and if you have this kind of heart, then you will obey him. But I want you to notice that Samuel was very careful in, mention, in describing this serve, this service. Now, I want you to look at verse 20. Now, he elaborates further in verse 20. But serve the Lord with all your heart. He did not simply say serve, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You want to say, Lord, I want to return to you? You want to say, Lord, well, I've not fallen into sin, then I've, I, I continue to serve you, but make sure you understand the qualification of the Christian service with all your heart. Now, what does it mean, with all your heart? The heart is involved. It is a heart that is totally surrendered to God. Lord, whatever your will is, whatever your desires are, my heart pursues after that. My heart wants to fulfill that. You see, we can serve the Lord grudgingly, unhappily, out of um, duty, that is all. But Samuel says, no, don't serve God like that. Serve with all your heart. Serving the Lord with all our heart is giving everything that we have, no, returning everything that we have. Their crops were from God. They began to understand now in this, in this destruction of the crops. Their crops were from God. Everything that you have is to be used for God. That is serving the Lord with your whole heart. Not Lord, you know, some of the things is for you, but other things is for me. My family, please do not touch my job. Please do not touch my, 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 my career uh, goals. Please keep out of it. Now, everything in life is meant for him. Everything that you pursue, everything that every decision you make, every choice you make, your whole heart says, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to use this, my life, 
my resources, my time. How do you want me to use it for you? Your whole heart has only one intent and purpose. Christian, is that how we live for God? So Samuel wants them to learn. Yes, you are frightened now. Yes, you're, you're, you're afraid now. Yes, you hear that you have second chance. Yes, you say, oh, we will serve the Lord, but please don't serve God like the way you used to. Half-hearted. One half for the Lord, the other half for myself. When you look at your children, when you look at your possessions, what is in your heart? All for Jesus? We sang just now. There is no joy in your life until all on the altar you lay. It's the same concept. Now, what else is serving God with all your heart? There is delight. There is joy. There is willingness. And if you don't have that, you ask God for forgiveness and ask Him to help you. Lord, I don't want to serve you like that. Now, do you feel this way? Maybe someone asked you to do something, or maybe you, you did something um, for someone, and you feel, ah, oh, I wasted my time. I, I used my time. Oh, I'd rather have gone out for, for a walk or exercise or went somewhere to eat, oh, but i got to do this. How do you feel when you have to so-called, well, give to the Lord's work? You don't see it as return. You, you do it grudgingly. Do you feel that I wish that I didn't have to serve in this ministry or that ministry. I would have more time for this and that, for my family, for myself as a single. Then you are not serving God with your whole heart. Your heart is still for yourself. Now, last but not least, serving the Lord with your whole heart is not living for God only on Sunday. Your whole life, Monday to Sunday, every moment is lived for the Lord. Every choice you make, every decision you make, you said, Lord, you are king of my life. These are my desires, but let me subject them to you. What do you want me to do, Lord? How do you want me to um, decide, Lord? Every moment is lived like that. It's your whole heart. You only have one desire, to please him. Whole heart. That is service. It begins there. Now, so we quickly, we have to move quickly. But he also says, now look at verse he qualifies again. All right? Look, look, at, look at verse 24. Only fear the Lord. He repeats that. We learn that. And serve him in truth with all your heart. Now he adds in truth with all your heart. In truth. You cannot make up your own Christianity. God, I want to serve you this way. God, I make Christianity should be like that. And he said, Lord, I, I will live Christianity in this way. You can't. It is in truth. means you serve, you live your life according to what God says. Not the social gospel, not the ecumenical movement, not all these things. It's you don't make up your own Christianity. And those of you who are given tasks to do for the Lord, you serve according to the Word of God. It's not what your preferences are, your, your desires are, your own agendas are. You serve according to truth. Now, like I said earlier on, this truth of Many truths in Christianity are gone today. It's the truth of God does all things for his own namesake. It's gone. Learn to serve him in this truth. It's all about God. It's always about him. Now, next. Then he says, obey. Like, look at verse 14 again. Obey. So fear, serve, and obey his voice and not rebel against his commandment. You see, it naturally leads to that. If you fear, means you desire to please him and not grieve him. Now, if you serve him, means he is king. Your heart is totally submitted to him and you live for him alone. All right? It naturally will lead you to obey his voice and not rebel against his commandments. What is the proof, my friend, of your whole heart for God? What is your proof that your whole heart is for God? Christ himself explained in the New Testament, if any man love me, if your heart is for me, he will keep my commandments. That is the proof at the end of the day. Now, Christian, I want to ask you this question, especially teens. Do you hate this word commandments? Do you dislike words like rule? But this is God. When it comes to God, it's always about king, rulership. Lord, rulership. Commandments, obedience. The world teaches us to, to resist all these things, to rebel. I hope 
that all of us, young or old, come to this stage that when you hear commandments, you delight. Lord, commandments tells me how to please you. I love commandments. How do you view commandments? Do you view commandments as wonderful because it leads you to fear and serve the Lord aright? Then you will delight that God tell me more. I want to attend more Bible studies. I want to hear things that I don't like because that is where I need to change as long as it is truth. The more I hear things that I don't like, that I know I need to change, and when I change, Lord, I know I will please you more. Lord, I delight in your commandments. You don't fear the Lord, you will rebel. This goes against my desires. Yes, I may do it outwardly, but I won't serve him with my heart. I serve him because daddy and mommy say so. Because church will look at me. I do it all because of that. That's all. Not your heart. I plead that, I plead with God that all of us will come to this point where you say, my life is in covenant with God. As long as you are safe, you are in the covenant of grace. And the covenant of grace means I have a purpose to fulfill. And if I have a purpose to fulfill, I love commandments because it helps me to fulfill my purpose on earth. I love commandments. The reason why I believe many of us do not like commandments is because we have not come to this realization that it is everything in life is for his name's sake. Whether you are a senior, whether you are a teenager, a preteen, until this sink into our hearts, we will resist God's commandments. So that is obedience, all right? Obedience. Now, then finally, it is in closing, verse 21. Turn ye not aside, all right? This is about following. And go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. After destroying the crops, Samuel said this. Now, why do you turn aside to vain things? What are vain things? Vain things means they are of no use. You want a king. The king is no use to you. It is God that is the one that makes the difference. But yet you want a king. And you pursue after vain things. The other thing about vain, the pursuit of vain things means this. They do not help you towards your covenantal purposes. They do not help you towards the Christian life that you should live on earth. They are vain. Many of the things that we pursue in life, riches, glory, praise, position. Now, if that is what God intends for you, they are not sinful. But by and large, for most of us, we simply want them because, because we want them for ourselves. They will not help you in your walk with God. They are vain. They will distract you. They will eventually destroy you. I want to be popular as a teen. I want to have this kind of job. I want to be in this kind of, um, um, possess this kind of things, this kind of lifestyle, this kind of retirement. For what? Is it to draw you closer to your purposes? So vain. You see, stop pursuing things that does not help you in your walk towards the Lord. They are vain. And that is what you have been wanting, a king, for, to achieve your desires. Now, Christian, when you keep hearing these things, do you just switch off after some time? Look at what Samuel says. Now, look at verse 23. Now he says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth. Now, Samuel says, I will continue to teach you. I will continue to teach you, and you may not like some of the things that I will continue to say, but they are good and the right way. Now, if you really, truly are grateful that it is not too late, and you really truly now begin to understand that God does all things for his name's sake and you exist for his name's sake, then stop resisting my teachings. I will continue to teach you. Have you switched off? Have you already made up in your heart and minds? I'm going to live for the world. Can't wait for this service to be over and go back and do what I want to do. Is that your heart? Well then, listen to what God says. Look at verse 25. 
But if ye shall steal do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and the warning also to the king. Don't just think that you have not committed those sins. You don't need a second chance. But if you, in your heart and mind, say, well, I'm not going to live this kind of life. My nominal Christian life, living for myself, for my purposes, I don't do think about covenantal purpose. You think that you can continue to steal, live such a life? God says, this is a wicked life. Why is it wicked? Both times, God says, wicked. When they rejected God, he says it's wicked. When you want to live your own life, it is wicked. God says that. When we pursue our own aims on earth, when we don't live a consecrated life, God says it's wickedness. Why? Look at verse 20, 24. It says, For consider how great things he had done for you. How can you be so wicked? God gave everything to you to succeed, but yet you say, Lord, I don't want you to rule in my life. That's wickedness. When you say, Lord, I want to continue to live a backslided life, I know you died for me, but I don't care. That is wickedness. And there is a warning in closing. Ye shall be consumed. Now, God gives us many chances, but don't think that, the, that it will keep going on and on and on and on and on. It is very prophetic for Samuel to say, Ye shall be consumed, consumed, both ye and your king. We will see what will happen to Saul, who still, after committing the first sin, still continue to refuse, refuse to realize it's not too late and repent and turn to God and live for, his, live for the purpose for which God made him king. He refused and he was consumed. So Christian, don't fool around with second chances that God gives you. Don't fool around as long as you're still alive. Those of you who still reject the gospel know that judgment will come. Don't test the patience of God. But I pray that many of us will say, Lord, for too long, for too long, Lord, I've lived for my own desires. Lord, I own you as my king now. Help me to live through these conditions. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. Shall we rise to sing the closing hymn? Hymn number 50, 50. Let us rise, hymn 50.